Welcome to Magnet Minutes. I'm Jordan Kimmel with an update for March 24th, 2022. And today I have an, a friend, Roger Maggio from Artography. So rather than just talking straight markets, artography is something that I'm interested in. But Roger, first of all, thanks for joining us. Pleasure, Jordan. Always nice to be with you. You're a great guy. Well, let me just set this up. You know, I met uh, Roger about 10 years ago, and he's an old Wall Street guy, but really followed his dream and his passion in the art world and has been doing something really, really kind of interesting with his business, which I really want to get into. But let me just, you know, come from a background, if I can, Roger, uh, you know, we're in this inflation environment, and it seems like collectibles of all kinds, especially art, are, are really catching a bid. And we'll talk about your business in, in just a few minutes. But from the broad landscape, is it all art? You know, what are you seeing in terms of, of the price appreciation, all that's going on in the art world right now? Well, from a collectible point of view, the world of art, which comprises photographic art and visual art paintings, you know, has experienced a tremendous growth, especially over the last five years, whether or not we're in a period of recession, et cetera, which are going into one. So that aspect of the business is good, but that's not our core business. Our core business transcends a much broader base, the base of wholesale and retail, uh, which would involve retail stores, you know, that sell furnishings and wall decor as complementary products to this. And also on the retail side for individuals who can't afford to spend 10, 20, 30,000 on a very expensive collectible piece of photographic or visual art, but yet would like some, you know, some pleasure, uh, open editions that are produced from those original uh, images. That's a very broad okay. market. And I know, and I know that really from your background and for, from knowing you for a while, you've had really deep relationships with some of the really iconic photographers who had relationships with some of the you know most well-known personalities where it seems like their artwork just got more and more valuable years and years after their, their death anyway. Um, but I remember, you know, you, you were doing something at Artography and, and in different iterations that, you know, is really highly unusual and unique. So I'll let you just jump right into, you know, your market segment. Well, our market segment uh, is not really focused specifically on just uh, photographic or visual art. It's what we can do with those photographic or visual art pieces to create revenue. You know, I, uh, my whole focus is, was to establish a company that wasn't a one trick pony. And the uh, artography, A-R-T-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y limited, okay, you know, embrace the opportunity of developing multiple streams of revenue. That comes from my financial background. Because if we were just reliant on uh, sales from a gallery or our two major websites uh, for specifically just prints only, well, that's a one trick pony. And if you're involved with a cycle, as all business cycles go, we could be either an up or down. Our focus was to establish products that could be produced in multiple uh, items. For example, I could take a piece of uh, uh, photographic art, let's say a Marilyn Monroe uh, photograph or a Marilyn Monroe painting, and all of ours are under license agreements with famous artists or with those we consider rising stars. I can produce more than just a photograph. I can produce a pillow, a beautiful scarf. I can produce a, a tables with those em emblazoned on it that could be put around pool areas, etc. I can produce sofa covers. I can produce other things, puzzles, etc. So that individual image could create three, four, five, six, seven, or more products from one image. That's a multiple revenue stream. That's the safety factor of our business model. It has very little to do with the art. It has to do with what can be produced in revenue from that art. Well, you know what you're saying is really fascinating. You know, what I'm visioning now, all of a sudden we are getting together, we are going to lounges and rather than just Marilyn Monroe picture up on the wall, there's a pillow, 
you know, right on the sofa and, uh, you know, just the many iterations and, and all that come from that uh, is frankly brand new. Maybe, maybe it's technology, the use of like new technology, printing technology that maybe didn't even exist when Marilyn was alive. Well, it's not really the technology. It's just, you know, I mean, puzzles have been around for years, as an example. Pillows have been around for years. It's what you put on that pillow or puzzle that will induce someone to buy that product. Someone might want to do a puzzle of Muhammad Ali. Someone else might want a scarf of Marilyn Monroe or a pillow of that or an abstract piece of art. Well, we have 24 collections, 27 different categories of photographic and visual art and 1,500 images to choose from. Now multiply that 1,500, not all are applicable, but let's say that 300 are applicable to doing the areas that I just discussed and multiply that seven times, okay? So we have so much we could do with our product base that we already have in-house under license agreement to produce various streams of revenue, multiple revenue streams. That's our core business foundation. Well, look, I even remember visiting your office years ago and I was so impressed with some of the art. You were kind enough you know, I left with a couple pieces uh, that were just, you know, fantastic. And again, whether it's the music world, whether it's the entertainment world, which I know you have a deep, you know, history with, uh, maybe, you know, you want to tell, tell us even some other areas. Like I know, for example, and I don't know if you're, you're into this, but um, I actually like the idea of being able to put something on my wall and, and touching it or seeing it on a pillow maybe. Uh, all of a sudden, there's these NFTs, which are files, and, and I'm not sure whether that business grows or not. It doesn't grow or not. I happen to be in the business of I love tangible. I love being able to see something and feel something. So, you know, maybe in this environment, there's winners and losers in the market. Uh, I think there's also fads people are chasing. Uh, but as a businessman, I know you've always been grounded in running profitable businesses with revenue. So maybe share if you want some of the winners and losers, some of the categories uh, that you see growth in. Well, you just mentioned uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and the application of, of uh, non-fungible tokens as a digital uh, as a, di in a digital format is just really over the last year and a half really blossomed and it's going to grow tremendously. The advantage of uh, a non-fungible token is that basically the certification and the ability you know, to have verification. As an example, if I have a print of signed by Hugh Hefner of Marilyn Monroe, someone might say, well, that's, that's a counterfeit. You can't okay. do that with a non-fungible token. The artist who creates that painting or photograph is signing that, okay? It's, it's, it, it, it's then in, in a digital format, it's certified, it goes into a wallet, and every time that's sold, the artist, the original artist can get paid commissions. I'm giving you a general overview of it, but the marketplace will be exploding in it. And th you know, there have been you know, issues or problems with it. It's been some areas of fraud, which have been very quickly uncovered. Uh, very difficult to, uh, uh, to get away with something in the digital world. It's very traceable, which is another advantage. But if you're speaking specifically of non-fungible tokens, NFTs for art, the, uh, uh, you would say, well, you know, I'm, I'm paying all this money, whether it's $100 or they've sold for millions too. Uh, you know, wh wh what can I do with it? It's a little small thing. It's a digital. I can put it on, on my uh, computer here, et cetera. But I really can't do much with it. Well, actually, you can because they're coming out with digital frames. So you'll be able in your house to put a digital frame up in various sizes. Currently not cheap, but prices will come down. And then all the art that you're collecting can be basically rotated between rooms, you know, in different sizes, et cetera. So as an art collector, okay, if you're collecting original, you know, non-fungible tokens of a specific uh, form of digital art, that's a tremendous advantage to you. And it's not right. a disadvantage to the physical world, but it opens up a whole new venue, uh, which is going to continue to grow, especially by millennials and those that are really in their early 20s to, I would say, 40s. That, that group understands you know, the world of uh, NFTs and is willing to 
tiptoe into it. And by tiptoeing, I mean, there was a, an NFT sold about a year ago. I think it was $60 million. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, so it's a real business. Christie's is in it. Sotheby's is in it. So when the big houses get involved in it, it lends credibility to the marketplace. And I see it only growing. Right. Well, Raj, that's a polite way of calling me square because I didn't believe in it at first. And like many other things, you know, I just miss it. I'm all about, you know, more tangible things. And and I, I remember when that piece sold and I actually took a picture of it, you know, on my um, on my own, you know, computer, but I don't own the rights to it. And therefore it's a whole different ball game. And, you know, what you described with the artwork, with the frames, you know, I remember reading about Bill Gates's home, you know, 10 years ago when he had those frames that could change, depends on, on who's visiting them and the mood that he's in. So there's just the case of technology now, I guess, coming a little bit more mainstream. And so, you know, so let me ask you, you know, particularly to your business and, and I know uh, your interest in, in international as well. So, you know, what's the story with, you know, offshore competition with China, with, with other markets, you know, obviously the United States as, as centric as we are only represents 4% of the population. And we know there's a whole lot going on outside the United States. Well, remember everything uh, uh, that is happening right now with supply chains are a function of the last 30 years of outsourcing everything, mostly to China, whether it's pharmaceuticals, et cetera. Our business model doesn't allow for that to happen. Everything that we do, that we produce in whatever format, whether it's a print, you can see one in back of me of Catherine Zeta Jones when she was 19, shot by world famous photographer, John Stoddard, a good friend. Um, when we produce that frame in back of me right now, in Plexi, all of that is done with US materials manufactured in the USA. We touch nothing. Our whole business model is outsourced. We have contract manufacturer that's worldwide. We have five, five manufacturing facilities in the United States, one in Canada, two in Mexico, one in Spain, one in the UK, and one in Australia. Each of those facilities will manufacture with US made materials and they'll deliver it in those countries or this in nine days or less, whether you order one piece or 5,000. Now, can the Chinese do that? They're stuck on a ship out there somewhere. But we didn't choose to compete with Chinese materials because with the exception of maybe 10% of what comes in in wall decor made in China, I mean, they're really inferior materials. We're not an operation that's looking to sell at, you know, Moe's home goods store, you know, for at a five and dime type of, uh, we're, you know, we're mid range to upper, but that's where the profit margins are. You have to go where the margins are, you know, we're, right. we're, we would rather do less volume and more profits than big volume and less profits. So yeah. that's how we're, we're structured. We don't touch anything uh, at the company. Everything is, uh, we, have, we have programmers, we have graphic artists, et cetera. We have accounting website managers, but we don't touch anything. No equipment, no nothing, no no expensive overhead or infrastructure. That's our business model. Well, Roger, that's the guy I met almost 10 years ago, a businessman, a Wall Street guy, followed his passion into art and, and made a beautiful business out of it. And I'll also share with anyone watching and listening, uh, Roger's a guy to know in the art world and, and around uh, the tri-state area here in the Northeast. So Roger, why don't you just, you know, share your websites. We'll give you a chance. We'll even show them uh, if we can on the video, but give us a chance where we actually find your art. And uh, I give you a lot of credit for building what you built. It's a beautiful enterprise. It's very simple, artographylimited.shop. That's our retail site, A-R-T-O, G-R-A-P-H-Y, limited spelled out, L-I-M-I-T-E-D, no spaces, dot S-H-O-P. Our wholesale site is the same, except it's dot com. So those are two websites, one for the wholesale industry and one for the retail uh, non-wholesale industry. All right. So listen, Roger, let me just thanks again for joining us. It's definitely uh, a, an eye for art that you've always had. You tied it to a great business. 
and thanks for joining us on Magna Minutes. Absolute pleasure, Jordan. Great to see you again. We'll see you at an art show soon, I hope.